studios for our regional late night bulletin. This is Chris. His ability to improvise and use... ...nobleman who faced up to Dustin Hoffman on the West End stage. The gent who toyed with Pauline Fowler's affections. And this intrepid band of elite fighting men. These were the men who had vowed to protect their homeland against any invader. Men who were dedicated to the principles of freedom and tolerance. Boy, put that Ronnie Lighthouse! We're making some film here. Oh, I don't care, put that light out. The man we're after is obviously a man of great courage with a highly developed sense of humor. He certainly worked with some very funny people. Go, <laughs> Penny! All right, Mike, so long. What about me, sir? You'll just have to wait. Right, for me, man. Why are you always so selfish? <laughs> I've recruited a platoon of comedy veterans to give me a tactical advantage when I take our man by surprise. Hang on. You're looking very smart, Private Harlan. Oh, thank you, Michael. The jacket's all right, but the trousers are a little bit tight under the armpits. What a shower. Let's get on board. Three years ago, viewers voted a scene from our hero's show as the funniest moment ever on British television. Right, now, we've wrecked a man's position. He's in a restaurant in this vicinity. This could turn nasty, but no need for weapons. We'll rely on hand-to-hand -hand combat. Who do you think you are kidding, Mr. Hitler? All right, Pike, you better come quietly. We have the place surrounded. And uh, I've got orders from HQ to bring you back straight away because tonight, Ian Lavender, this is your life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've got to speak. No, thank you. Oh, really? that's, 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 sorry. That's all right, it's only yeah, me. I'm just, hello. oh, oh, you rat bags. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm just thinking there's so many paybacks going on here. Uh. <laughs> Waiting in the studio, more surprises for Ian Lavender, including Hollywood greetings from Frasier star David Hyde Pierce. Wendy Richard looks in from Albert Square. A further reunion of part-timers from Warmington-on-Sea. And the truth at last about Roy Rogers and Trigger. Took you by surprise, didn't Yeah, we? slightly. Uh, um, can I just say something immediately? Yes. These two lads, they, um, they owe me nothing, but they've given me so much to be proud of. Um, I shall introduce them momentarily. In fact, <laughs> let me do all the intros. A very distinguished group of uh, friends from show business here, including, of course, the old comrades who helped me surprise you, Bill Pertwee, Michael Knowles, and Geoffrey Holland. Also here, golfing pals Billy Walker and Willie Thorne. Members of the Lavender family, your brother Paul, your sons Dan and Sam. And to fill the gap at your side, your wife Mickey. So, Mickey, a very fruitful meeting. Yes, we first met on the stage show of Dad's Army, and the choreographer had to go to Germany, and I was her assistant, and they put in a number about a banana, <laughs> um, and he was the banana, and I had to choreograph a banana, <laughs> along with the rest of the crew. There he is. And it wasn't easy, and he wasn't easy, but there you go. <laughs> 
Well, Ian Lavender, you shot to fame playing a nincompoop, the lovable Private Pike in the classic series Dad's Army. You're about to celebrate your 35th anniversary of entertaining people on stage and screen. So let's take a look at Private Pike's progress. Very smart, Corporal. What's that supposed to be, boy? <laughs> well, you said if you had nothing else, we'd tie a carving knife to a broom handle. I didn't say keep the brush on the end of it, you stupid boy. Well, it should have stayed. I don't want any insubordination. Take this man's name, Sergeant. Now, what's your name, lad? Well, you should know by now. You've been a friend of my mum since before I was born. <laughs> has got to be infectious, a streaker here at the age a combination then of Twickenham and Lords, the policeman's helmet can leap over the wicket, but at least the crowd will enjoy it, and as it goes, that really is an old thing. What kind of noise does the alarm make? It's a siren, madam. A siren? I hope it's like the QE2s. <laughs> We've sailed on her, you know. <laughs> I've got it now, yeah. I know who you remind me of. My dad. <laughs> when he was younger, of course, but it's quite a resemblance. Only he, he was taller. <laughs> Not quite so weedy. <laughs> Much better looking. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Pauline. Congratulations. We couldn't have done it without you. Oh, thank you. I suppose this is your son. Uh, no, no, this is David. Hi. My partner. I'll be outside. My boyfriend. In that last clip, you'd arrived in Walford as a drama expert enrolled to produce the Albert Square Christmas Panto. Over now to the queen of the Fowler clan, Wendy Richard. I was so thrilled when they said you're going to come and join me for a while in EastEnders. Thrilled for Wendy and thrilled for Pauline. It was such a pleasure to work with you again after, what was it, a mere 30 years since we were together in Dad's Army when I played Jimmy Beck's girlfriend. And it was great, not just working with you, but our visits down memory lane and, and the stories we recounted together. It was great fun. Lots of love to Mickey and your family, and you keep well. God bless you, Ian. From Walford to Hollywood, one of the actors you most admire but have never met is the man who plays Dr. Niles Crane in the American TV comedy Frasier. I'm right, aren't I? Oh, absolutely, yes. Those two, and that man in particular, just show how fast can be done so beautifully, so delicately. I just think he's magic. Well, I agree with your opinion, and so does Niles. Uh, in fact, he sends you this message from Sunset Boulevard. <laughs> David Hyde Pierce. Hello, Ian. It's David Hyde Pierce here, uh, wishing you congratulations on having a life, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, thrilled to be a part of the celebration. I have to tell you honestly that when BBC came to me and said they were doing this, um, I wasn't familiar with Dad's Army, and uh, I didn't know your work. So I went to my favorite English person, Jane Leaves, who plays Daphne, and I said, Jane, kiss me here. And then I said, who's Ian Lavender? And when I said your name, her face lit up. You'd think I'd have said toffee. She was so excited. And uh, she went on and on about the show and about you. And then I, I got tapes of, uh, of Dad's Army as well and watched it and loved it and love you as well. I think you're just, just terrific. I also got this wonderful interview off the internet in which you've been asked, who's your favorite actor on TV recently? And you answer, David Hyde Pierce, who plays Niles in Frasier. He displays a beautiful blend of comic styles from the delicate through to pure slapstick. Well, I have to ask a question. Uh, that answer shows such discretion, such wit, <laughs> such intelligence, <laughs> such discernment on your part. How could anyone ever call you stupid boy? <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, I'm so happy to be a part of this, and uh, I'm truly honored uh, for your kind compliment, because coming from you, uh, that means a lot to me. Have a wonderful time, and take care. Thank you. 
Not bad. Now let's get down to detail. You were born on February the 16th, 1946, at Bethany Nursing Home, Northfield in Birmingham. Your father, Edward, was a police sergeant, and your mother, Kath, ran the household at Mavis Road. You were baptised, Arthur Ian Lavender. Paul, your brother had a, a vivid imagination. Quite so. Very early on, he introduced us to a friend of his, Pippi Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever saw Pippi Jim, but she had to hold doors open for him, help him on buses and trams, and even had a place laid for him at table. Well, I'm not to say that Pippi Jim is here tonight. <laughs> He's sitting between Billy and Willie. <laughs> <laughs> he looks well, doesn't he? <laughs> Always as I imagined him. <laughs> <laughs> you go to Turves Green School and you get involved in school plays, winning a role as Mozart because you can play the piano a bit, and then the teacher lets you play Pontius Pilate because you had a book about him. Uh, <laughs> you were a cowboy fan as well, and one hero of the West was an early influence on you. Ian, tell us how Roy Rogers came into your life. He must have been probably the first person I was taken to see it in a theatre. Roy Rogers at the Hippodrome in Birmingham. I caught, with the help of my father, a metal six-gun. <laughs> <laughs> they threw... He, th he, didn't throw, he didn't throw trigger out. He threw six guns into the audience. And I caught one, and that was my first gun, because we couldn't afford one. They were about seven and sixpence at the time. Ah. And so um, I think he made me want to go to the theatre more and more. I, I thought he got gifts every time he went. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that neither Roy nor Trigger is here. <laughs> but, uh, in fact, one of them has been stuffed, but that's another story. Oh, no, poor Roy. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, the smell of the grease paint and Trigger in your nostrils. You go on to Bourneville Technical School for Boys. Yes. You deliver your first stage kiss in a co-production with the Bourneville Girls of The Ladies <laughs> Not For Burning. In your last year, you're made head boy. Now, having won a provisional place at Keele University, you're selected to go on a tour of Canada through the prestigious W.H. Rhodes Educational Trust. But you, you give up your university place to take up an offer from the Bristol Old Vic Drama School. And for a while in Bristol, you share a flat with another drama student. Yes, Ian. Pull your little bolero jacket down and squeeze your lemon. <laughs> <laughs> now, this should be good. It's the brilliant Maggie <laughs> Steed. <laughs> So, Maggie, the answer's a lemon, you say? Yes. yes. We had a, a wonderful, wonderful teacher called Rudy Shelley, who was a great inspiration. And he said that if you wanted to be a good actor and you had to stand very well, and you were always a very good stander, <laughs> you had, exactly, come up here and you can do exactly what I tell you. You had to pull your little bolero jacket down and imagine you had a lemon between your buttocks. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a slice of lemon. <laughs> There was never a whole lemon, <laughs> never. I just remember very, very clearly when we were both rather seriously out of work, and I was working in a pub in Soho, and, uh, and you came in and you said, oh, I think I've got a job. <laughs> and, and it's a series about uh, uh, these old soldiers. <laughs> and, and I just want to say that you gave my parents so much pleasure. <laughs> so thanks a lot. <laughs> Maggie, thank you. Me a few. <laughs> you get your first break in television in February 1968, playing a young man with artistic ambitions in the TV drama Flowers at My Feet. And it was only a month later, the age of 22, that you're cast as Private Pike in Dad's Army. By a bit of luck, your then agent, Anne Callender, is married to the show's co-writer and director, David Croft, and uh, he agrees to give you an audition. The series, which first flickered onto our black and white screens on July the 31st, 1968, was to run for 10 years and 80 episodes. Let's get back on patrol with Warmington on Sea's Barmy Army. You've got smashing eyebrows. Have I? <laughs> <laughs> What do you want now, Pike? I'm sorry to disturb you again, Mr. Mannering, but mm. Mrs. Mannering's on the phone again. Oh. I told her you were having coffee with Mrs. Fox, but she insists... <laughs>
you stupid boy. And it's good to have the vicar and Mrs. Fox here, Frank Williams and Pamela Cundell. Liz Fraser, who played your mum in Dad's Army, the film. And uh, our favourite air raid warden, Bill Pertwee. Now, Bill, you've already tried to put our lights out, but now what would you like to say? Well, I'd just like to say about Ian that the stupid boy tag was a wonderful idea because of all the, the people who's not a stupid boy is Ian. He's a good lad. He's made a wonderful part out of Private Park. I mean, he's played it beautifully and got um, many laughs that another actor wouldn't have done. He's uh, a great credit to him, and it's been a great pleasure to work with him all the time. A senior member of the platoon is currently confined to his billet in Portugal. <laughs> we'll get a word from uh, Corporal Jones, alias Clive Dunn. First, a message from Barbados, where we find the show's co-writer, Jimmy Perry. Good Lord. Thanks, Ian, for playing me all those years. As most people know now, Private Pike was me when I was a 17-year-old boy in the Home Guard at Watford. You were a young drama student, raw, inexperienced, and they threw you in at the deep end, working with such veteran actors as Arthur Lowe, John LeMessurier, and of course, the legendary John Laurie. Sadly, Ian, Private Pike's hair is almost as white as mine. <laughs> but never mind, we go on. Here's to you, Ian. We used to meet, didn't we, outside the fire engine station at Hammersmith Broadway, of all places, every morning to go to work, and you hopped in my old motor car, we trundled off to glorious Acton, to whatever fate awaited us. And over the years, you played that part so beautifully. You're a very, very good actor and very, very funny. And we love seeing you do it. God bless you, brother. More than 30 years later, Dad's Army repeats still attract millions of viewers. And uh, three years ago, viewers voted this scene as their all-time favourite moment in British television comedy. <laughs> that U-boat captain is currently on stage, inappropriately a production of The Deep Blue Sea. But you're still on his list, Philip Maddock. Ian, congratulations. 80 episodes were made of Dad's Army. I was only involved in one as the U-boat commander but I've come to think of myself as an honorary member of an elite society. Uh, Ian, two things I'd like to say now. Apropos that moment, I was there. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> Pike is now immortal. Have a great evening. In 1969, you marry your first wife, Suzanne Kirchis. Son, Daniel, is born in December 1972, and Sam, three years later. Dan, was your dad good company? Yeah, absolutely. Um, he just kept making things for us. Remember, we used to love Star Wars. We had Star Wars wallpaper and Star Wars bedsheets, and he meticulously made us two Star Wars models, uh, Millennium Falcon and uh, Star Destroyer. And they would, you know, spent hours making them, but, well, we wanted to emulate the film with special effects, so we... <laughs> Stuffed them with bangers and blew them up. <laughs> <laughs> but Sam, your dad influenced your choice of careers. Absolutely. I mean, both of us. Um, he was one of the first dads to have a video recorder. And every weekend we'd be around there watching his favourite movies, horror movies, sci-fi <laughs> movies. <laughs> and here I am, uh, having helped produce my first film. And Dan is a TV and film computer animator. So, um, <laughs> Thanks for the inspiration. I think we do owe you a thing or two. Thank you. <laughs> As a boy, Ian, one of your favourite radio programmes had been Take It From Here, featuring oh. the Glum family. And in 1978, you fulfil a childhood ambition by playing the gormless Ron in a TV version. Ron Glum, you are going to tell me here and now what has made you take to hitting yourself on top of the head with a hammer. Is it some form of guilt? No, it's... Family troubles? No, it's... An affair of the heart? No, it's... <laughs> what? I've got a sixpence stuck up my nose. <laughs> Playing the faithful F to your dim-witted Ron, Patricia Brake. Oh.
<laughs> Patricia, tell me it was a happy show. Oh, yes, it was. I think, in fact, we laughed far more than we ought to have done. <laughs> but, in one thing I remember so clearly, there was an episode called The Bath. Uh, Jimmy Edwards, as Mr Glum, got his toe caught in the plug hole. And because I had to go and help, and because they were terribly afraid that I would be embarrassed, they would filled the bath with gravy browning, so it looked like <laughs> stew. Uh, and also, to add insult to injury, Ron had put his uh, pet goldfish in the bath for exercise. <laughs> <laughs> so Jimmy said to Ron, uh, Ron, uh, bend down and look at the bottom of the bath. And Ron, of course, put his head straight into the soup. <laughs> well, I've never heard laughter like it. <laughs> uh, in fact, they laughed so much, the audience, that technically they couldn't cope. And for the first time ever in my life, and I've done a lot of comedy, the audience was told not to laugh so much. <laughs> <laughs> Unheard of. <laughs> and we had to do it again, which was very, very difficult. It was really <laughs> and it's lovely to be here. Thank you. Okay. Patricia, thank you. In 1984, you play a salesman who hates selling things in the David Nobbs comedy, Hello, Goodbye Man. Your co-star in that series was Mary Tam. <laughs> You've appeared in many West End plays, including Dustin Hoffman's version of The Merchant of Venice. And you star as another of your comedy idols, Buster Keaton, for the biographical play Buster. Melvin Hayes, you've done a tour or two together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ian, <clears throat> you are a brilliant actor, especially in the theatre. <laughs> If there was a laugh there, you'd find it. If there wasn't, you'd dig and dig and dig and dig until one grew. But you're not that good. When it comes to first nights backstage in your dressing room, we were doing a tour of Rumpy Your Wife, and we had dressing rooms next door to each other, and the, the walls were paper thin, so I cleared everything that was going on next door. And they called, Act One Beginners, please. And I heard you throw up. <laughs> And I knocked on there and I said, please, could you stop throwing up in there? And you said, why? I said, because I can't concentrate. I'm trying to throw up in here. <laughs> you are a smashing bloke. I love you. <laughs> Cheers. And you've written, directed and appeared in more than 20 pantomimes. But in 1992, life suddenly became very serious. You were diagnosed with cancer of the bladder. Now, you were due to have an operation as soon as the Manchester run of Noises Off had finished, but your condition worsened and the operation was brought forward. You must have felt very low. Well, I don't know. Yes. Yes, you oh. did, really. And, and I, I went in there and I had to um, transfuse me with quite a few um, Units. pints of blood. And I just saw that man over there and that man over there, Nigel. Um, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for him. And well, let me introduce the people you're saying thanks to. Two people who helped you are here. Nigel Bullock, consultant urologist at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, with your radiographer, Barbara Satch. Nigel, was Ian a good patient? Yes, he was a good patient, but he was a very frightened patient, and he had a lot of difficult decisions to make. Um, I think we helped to a degree to get him through that, but I think Mickey did most of the hard work. Oh. Uh, saw him through a course of radiotherapy. Uh, he comes back to see us once a year now, and you see we're ten years on now, and he's doing extremely well. Last Tuesday afternoon was well, not terribly comfortable. No. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> <laughs> the nice thing is he still remembers us, because when he faced the dreaded Anne Robinson on The Weakest Link, he donated the £14,000 to Adam Brooks. So, Ian, thank you very much indeed on behalf of everybody at Adam Brooks for that. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Throughout your illness, you were determined to carry on working. They say the show must go on, but Ian, this was ridiculous. It's Rick Wakeman. <laughs> <laughs> So, Rick, which show are we talking about? Well, I do, I do a thing in churches, so it's an oratorio called The New Gospels, and Ian was our narrator. And you were ill. You were not a well man. And Mickey phoned me up. I was in Newcastle and she said, we know you're booked to do the church in, in Glasgow in the December. She said, I don't think he's going to be able to do it. He's really not well, but he wants to talk to you. So I drove down from Newcastle overnight. I had a bit of a night of it. And you weren't very well. You remember, you were lying there. And you were really lying. You, could, you couldn't walk. And you looked at me and you said, you don't look very well, do you? <laughs> 
And I said, um, you wanted to see me? He said, yeah, I want to change some of the words. I know. <laughs> so I mean, what can I do? So, so I walk away, Mickey says he's going to do it now. I said, yeah. So we got you up there somehow, do you remember? Yes. I don't know how we did it. And it was absolutely remarkable. I said to you after, you're, you're real, this could have killed you. You said, well, I'm in a church. <laughs> You're a very special man, I tell you. <laughs> Rick, thanks. Thank you. As far as work is concerned, you are a busy man. In fact, it's come full circle because you're currently touring in The Ghost Train, uh -huh. a thriller that was written by none other than your dad's army chum, Arnold Ridley, alias dear old Private Godfrey. Other ghost trainees are here for you tonight. Henry McGee, Christopher Strowley and Judy Cornwell. To millions of television fans the world over, you'll always be the youthful and innocent Private Pike, Captain Mannering's stupid boy. But it was a smart piece of casting that changed the life of a 22-year-old actor fresh out of drama school. The credit goes to the husband and wife team who got you your first break, David and Anne Croft. <laughs> David, your go. Well, being the youngest of the platoon, we called upon you to do some pretty awkward things that uh, the, the older ones couldn't do, uh, particularly when it's concerned with water. <laughs> uh, and we had to create a bog on one occasion, so we dug a hole about six foot deep and uh, put you in it, and there were various rostrums, so you could look further and further down as the day went on. Shooting went marvellously, until suddenly you yelled, Get me out of here! So we got you out of here, and what's the matter, we said? I've got a frog in my trousers. <laughs> <laughs> Anne, it was you who spotted Ian's talent. Yes, I suppose it was, really. It was my job to go and look for talent down in the drama schools, and I went down to um, Bristol Old Vic School to see you play Benedict in All's Well That Ends Well, and you sported the most amazing blonde Beatles cut. It just so happened that it was the A-level play of the year. There were queues and queues and queues of girls waiting for his autograph. <laughs> so I looked and I said, well, here's an actor that's got charm and sex appeal and talent. And it proved to be right. <laughs> oh. And David and I are really proud of you. Oh, we really are. <laughs> Bless you. Ian Lavender, this is your life. Settle. Now, are there any elevations for viewing? We're breaking the mould in stadium design. But today, I've got something to show you that's really exciting. Using some sticky back plastic and a few household items. Here's one I made earlier. If you've got talent, whether it's in front of the camera or behind the scenes, you could be just who we're looking for. Call 08705 100 700 or visit the website BBC Talent. If you've got it, we'll flaunt it. <laughs> You're a long way up, and there's only one way down. Who can save you? 